Play one, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Friedel and Brian Lynn. Later, Dorothy Gundy and Ashley will bring us the next part in our series on America's national parks. But first, Matt Kaufman is a wildlife researcher at the University of Wyoming. He leads the Wyoming Migration Initiative, which studies the migratory paths of animals like deer and elk in the American state of Wyoming. In 2019, Kaufman and other scientists were talking at a conference in Italy. He began thinking that wildlife around the world had the same difficulties faced by Wyoming's migratory deer and elk. We just spontaneously got together, nine or ten of us who work on migrations around the world, Kaufman told the Jackson Hole News and Guide. We realized that a lot of the same things we were trying to address by mapping migrations in Wyoming were applicable globally. Their talk in 2019 was the beginning of an international effort that now includes 92 scientists and environmentalists. Their effort is called the Global Initiative on Ungulate Migration. Ungulates are animals with hooved feet, like deer and elk. The aim is to gather information on the seasonal movements of gazelles and saiga in Mongolia to Norwegian reindeer. The hundreds of paths would then be presented in an electronic migration map. The researchers wrote a report that recently appeared in the publication Science. The report describes how animal movements over long distances to get food and other resources are not doing so well. The main reason for the struggles comes from land development by humans. Roads and fences create barriers for the animals, restricting their movement. And the warming of the planet has also unsettled environmental systems. The possibility of losing some ungulate migrations makes mapping and protecting the paths that much more urgent. Migration was not well understood until recently. GPS technologies enabled researchers to document the exact paths that animals take across land. Historic data about numbers of animals traveling those paths is largely lacking. Otto Meisterud, a biology professor at the University of Oslo in Norway, is one of the scientists working with Kaufman on the international effort. He said he hopes the effort will help Norway take steps to recognize and plan in a way that preserves its migratory reindeer red deer, and moose. Today, that recognition and planning is lacking. Many of the northern European migrations are in decline. Meisterud said, It remains to be seen if this is a starting point of a new direction or if it will be some kind of historical map of how the migrations used to be. Joe Ogutu studies migratory East African wildebeest, zebra, and Thompson's gazelle for the University of Hohenheim in Stuttgart, Germany. Since 2015, he has watched the ungulate migration called Maraloita in southwestern Kenya 
stop working because of fence building and sharing land space with hundreds of thousands of sheep and goats. This migration we can save, Ogutu told the News and Guide. It has collapsed, but it has not died because the animals that participated in the migration are still there. Ogutu hopes that the Global Initiative on Ungulate Migration brings attention to the Maraloita migration and other at-risk paths. Publicity and attention, he said, will hopefully lead to its restoration and protection. The global effort is in partnership with the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals, a United Nations agreement. The virtual map will use GPS tracking technology, mapping software, and data sharing applications, along with local and indigenous knowledge. Another goal of the project is to map lost migrations, documenting local and historical knowledge of animal movements. One in three women worldwide will experience physical or sexual abuse in her lifetime. Violence against women has been called by global leaders the human rights issue of our time, a pandemic, said Cheryl Thomas, the head of the organization Global Rights for Women. 137 women a day are killed by their intimate partners or their family members, she added. In the United States, President Joe Biden is now asking lawmakers to provide more resources for the Justice Department's Office on Violence Against Women. The proposal calls for increasing its budget to $1 billion, almost two times the current amount. Patricia Cumbie was a young adult in college when she was raped. A man attacked her at a party. I remember at the time feeling like, oh, is what happened to me a crime or not? And I think that's a very common reaction for a lot of survivors, you know, because violence against women is so normalized. The United States has been a world leader in the Violence Against Women movement. In 1994, Congress passed the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA, which created the Office on Violence Against Women. Joe Biden, a senator at the time, led the push for that law. It was the first of its kind in the world. Cumbie, who also works with Global Rights for Women, says the U.S. sets an important example. Domestic violence is the privilege and power that men have to abuse women, she said. There is stranger danger, she continued, but by and large, the violence is carried out by people that we know and love. That fact, she says makes the issue more complex and difficult to talk about. Comfort Dondo, a Zimbabwean immigrant in Minneapolis, says she spent five years in an abusive marriage. And when I called the Minneapolis Police Department, they would come and they would not even talk to me or take a report, she said. They would talk to him. The abuse was not only physical, Dondo says. Her husband's better knowledge of the legal system resulted in her losing custody of her son. She is now seeking to get him back. She said, When we talk about domestic abuse, it goes beyond just the beating. It is the emotional torture of alienating a woman from her babies. 
Thomas says violence against women is accepted because most societies are used to seeing men in positions of power and control. The violence, physical and emotional, sometimes includes separating women from their friends and loved ones. Domestic violence is closely related to other forms of inequality. Dondo said her white husband has much more power over her, a black woman in America. I speak for African Americans. That's my experience. When we end up marrying white men, Dondo said, the white man has more power over her, access to money for good lawyers, language, and they also know the system very well. Victoria Banyard is a professor of social work and director of the Center on Violence Against Women and Children at Rutgers University. She thinks financing crime prevention is a good step, but also that more money should be put towards stopping abuse before it starts. Violence against women can take many forms, she points out, from verbal, emotional abuse and physical violence to blocking a woman from her friends and loved ones to economic abuse. If you're experiencing physical violence, for example, you might have to miss time at work, she said. A woman might lose her job as a result. Sometimes, abusers also block victims from having a career at all. There are many ways domestic violence affects women and holds them back economically, she said. After escaping her marriage, Comfort Dondo went to school and completed a master's degree. Later, she started the nonprofit organization Fumalani, which works to stop violence and abuse of women, especially those from African ancestry. I'm Dan Friedel. China recently made history by successfully landing a spacecraft on Mars. The event marked a major step in China's space program and launched a new international exploration effort on the Red Planet. China's official Xinhua News Agency announced the landing on May 15th. China has left a footprint on Mars for the first time, an important step for our country's space exploration, it said. China's space program had already completed several successful unpiloted missions to the moon. The country's last spacecraft to land there was able to successfully collect material from the lunar surface. It was the first time in more than 40 years that any nation had collected moon material for return to Earth. Landing a spacecraft on Mars, however, is much more difficult than landing on the moon. The vehicles require special equipment to protect against the extreme heat of the Martian atmosphere. The spacecraft also require special rockets to slow its speed and parachutes that deploy at just the right time to prevent crash landings. Historically, there have been many crash landings on Mars. So far, only three nations, the United States, China, and the Soviet Union, have successfully landed spacecraft. The U.S. has had nine successful Mars landings since 1976. This includes its latest mission involving the U.S. Space Agency NASA's Perseverance Explorer, 
or rover. The USSR's Mars 3 spacecraft landed safely in 1971, but that mission ended seconds later when the spacecraft's instruments failed. There are currently other spacecraft operating in orbit around Mars. One was launched by the United Arab Emirates and arrived in February. The Emirates Mars mission is studying Martian atmospheric conditions from an extremely high orbit. Three other orbiting spacecraft belong to the U.S., two are European, and one is from India. China's Tianwen-1 spacecraft, which includes an orbiter, lander, and rover, spent seven months on the trip to Mars. It landed at Utopia Planitia, a large, flat area in the northern half of the planet. Its rover, Jurong, was named after the Chinese god of fire. The six-wheeled vehicle is solar-powered and weighs 240 kilograms, Xinhua reported. It has several cameras and other instruments that use radar, laser, and sensors to measure atmospheric conditions and magnetic forces. Jurong is to study the planet's surface soil and atmosphere. Like the past and present NASA rovers, it will also look for signs of ancient life, including ice and any other water below the planet's surface. Data collected by Jurong will be sent back to Earth through the Tianwen-1 orbiter. Last week, China released the rover's first pictures from Mars. Roberto Orase is a planetary scientist at the Institute of Radio Astronomy in Bologna, Italy. He told Nature an important part of the mission could help confirm earlier studies suggesting the presence of permafrost in the area around Utopia Planitia. The studies found evidence that permafrost could be hiding just below the surface. The rover's ground-searching radar equipment might be able to identify signs of this permafrost, Orase said. Learning the depth of such permafrost and finding out more about its formation could offer new information into more recent climate changes on Mars. Scientists are trying to understand what happened to ancient water they believe once covered the surface, Orase added. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson praised China's successful landing on Mars. As the international scientific community of robotic explorers on Mars grows, the United States and the world look forward to the discoveries Jurong will make to advance humanity's knowledge of the Red Planet, his statement read. I look forward to future international discoveries, which will help inform and develop the capabilities needed to land human boots on Mars, Nelson added. I'm Brian Lynn. Today, on our National Parks journey, we travel to the largest state in terms of land area, Alaska. Alaska is home to more national parks than any other state. 
It is also home to North America's tallest mountain, the 6,190-meter-high Denali Peak. The peak gives the surrounding protected area its name. Welcome to Denali National Park in central Alaska. Denali's grounds cover more than 2.4 million hectares. Within the park are glaciers, clear rivers, peaceful forests, and wildlife such as wolves, moose, bears, and sheep. Denali National Park seems huge, yet only one road goes through the park. Hundreds of thousands of visitors travel down that road each year to experience the Alaskan wild. Denali National Park was first established 100 years ago. At the time, the park and North America's tallest mountain were known by another name. Many Americans knew the famous peak as Mount McKinley. In the late 1800s, gold miners unofficially named the peak after William McKinley, the 25th U.S. president. At the time, McKinley was still a presidential candidate. McKinley himself never traveled anywhere near the mountain, but the name stuck. In Alaska, however, locals continued to call the mountain Denali. The word Denali means the high one for the Athabascan people, many of whom lived north of the mountain. The area became a national park on February 26, 1917. Its name was Mount McKinley National Park. Some naturalists disagreed with the naming decision. A debate continued for more than half a century, a sign of the area's long and complex history. In 1975, Alaskan state officials asked the federal government to change the name to Denali to honor the native Alaskans. But congressional members from the state of Ohio, where McKinley was from, opposed and blocked the renaming efforts. In late 1980, Weeks before his presidency ended, Jimmy Carter increased the size of the park from 800,000 hectares to 2.4 million hectares. The expanded park also took on a new name. It became the Denali National Park and Preserve. The naming debate, however, was not over. Although the park took the name of Denali, the mountain itself still remained Mount McKinley for another 35 years. In August 2015, former President Barack Obama officially changed the name from Mount McKinley to Denali. The announcement was made shortly before Obama traveled to Alaska. His visit was aimed at publicizing the effects of climate change in the state. The animals living within Denali National Park are just as famous as its tallest peak. In fact, Denali was the first national park created in order to protect wildlife. The park is home to 39 kinds of mammals and over 160 kinds of birds. Many people come to Denali 
to see the park's largest mammals. Some moose here weigh well over 500 kilograms. More than 1,700 caribou live within the grounds. Doll sheep flock together on hillsides. Wolves are everywhere in the park. Denali is known as one of the best places to observe wolves in the wild. Giant grizzly bears can also be seen. They enjoy catching salmon and eating wild berries in the summer. Denali also protects the remains of a prehistoric ecosystem. In 2005, geologists discovered fossilized evidence of dinosaur tracks within Denali. Tests showed the fossil to be about 70 million years old. It was the first sign of dinosaurs in central Alaska. Since then, scientists have discovered more than 300 fossil sites. The fossils preserve evidence of other ancient creatures and many kinds of plants. With each discovery, a more complete picture of Denali's past comes to life. Adventure-seeking travelers visit Denali to climb North America's tallest peak. The first successful climb to the very top happened on June 7, 1913, when four men reached the summit. Every year, more than 1,000 people try to reach Denali's summit. Only about half of them succeed. Climbing Denali is extremely difficult. Climbers face harsh conditions and extreme weather. Winds can blow at speeds of more than 160 kilometers an hour. They must use special equipment to travel along glacier ice and difficult terrain. The Cahiltna Glacier is the longest glacier here. Climbers know it as the starting point for summiting Denali. It sees some of the most extreme temperatures of any place on Earth. Most successful climbs take about three weeks. Several local businesses offer group climbs. Visitors can enjoy Denali in more restful ways, too. Many people travel by bus along the park's single road. Travel companies offer half-day bus tours. Others choose to ride bicycles along the long road. This gives them a chance to get up close to Denali's wildlife and peaceful environment. The park operates six campsites and offers several kilometers of trails. Denali is also home to a group of sled dogs. These Alaskan huskies are an important part of the park experience. Visitors can watch sled dog demonstrations in the summer to learn about this traditional Alaskan way of travel. The park's past present and future connect many different cultures and people across time. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dorothy Gundy. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.